Hey everyone, welcome back. How's it going? So we are going to be continuing reading through the silver chair. Yesterday, we stopped in the middle of chapter one and we are gonna continue on. We'll see how far we get today. Um, Jill and Eustace were trying to get away from them and they were running. I'm gonna start a little bit uh, before where we ended yesterday. If only the door was open again, said Scrub. And they went on and Jill nodded. For at the top of the shrubbery was a high stone wall. And in that wall, a door by which you could get out onto the open moor. This door was nearly always locked, but there had been times when people had found it open or perhaps there had just been one time. But you can imagine how the memory of even one time kept people hoping and trying the door for, as, for if it should happen to be unlocked, it would be a splendid way of getting outside the school grounds without being seen. Jill and Eustace, both now very hot and very grubby from going along almost double under the laurels, panted up to the wall, and there was the door, shut as usual. Oh, it's sure to be no good, said Eustace with his hand on the handle, and then, oh, by gum, for the handle turned, and the door opened. That's where I should have ended yesterday. A moment before, both of them had meant to get away through that doorway in double-quick time, but by any chance, if by any chance the door was not locked, but when that door actually opened, they both stood stock still, for what they saw was quite different from what they expected. What they had expected to see was the gray, heathery slope of the moor going up to join the dull autumn sky. Instead, a blaze of sunshine met them. It poured through the doorway as the light of the June day pours into a garage when you open the door. It made the drops of water on the grass glitter like beads and showed up the dirtiness of Jill's tear-stained face. And the sunlight was coming from what certainly did look like a different world, what they could see of it. They saw smooth turf, smoother and brighter than Jill had ever seen before, and the blue sky darting to and fro, things so huge that they might have been jewels or huge butterflies. Although she had been lo longing for something like this, Jill felt frightened. She look at, looked at Scrub's face and saw that he was frightened too. Come on, Paul, he said in a breathless voice. Can we get back, said Jill, is it safe? At that moment, a voice shouted from behind them, a mean, spiteful little voice. Now then, Paul, it squeaked. Everyone knows you're there, down you come. It was the voice of Edith Jackal. Not one of them herself, but one of their hangers-on and tail-bearers. Quick, here, hold hands. We mustn't get separated. And before she knew quite what was happening, he had grabbed her hand and pulled her through the door, out of the school grounds, out of England, out of our whole world, into that place. The sound of Edith Jackal's voice stopped as suddenly as the voice on a radio when it had switched off. And instantly, there was quite a different sound all around them. It came from those bright things overhead, which turned out to be birds, they were making a riotous noise, but it was much more like music, rather advanced music, which you don't often hear, take in at first hearing, than bird songs ever are in our world. Yet in spite of the singing, there was a sort of background of immense silence. That silence combined with the freshness of the air made Jill think that they must be on top of a very high mountain. Scrubs still had her by the hand, and they were walking forward, staring about them on every side. Jill saw that huge trees rather like cedars, but bigger, grew in every direction. But they did not grow close together, and as there was no undergrowth, this did not prevent one from seeing a long way into the forest to the left and right. And as far as Jill's eye could reach, it was the same. Level turf, darting birds with yellow or dragonfly blue, or rainbow plumage, blue shadows and emptiness. There was not a breath of wind in that cool, bright, it was a very lonely forest. Right ahead, there were no trees, only blue sky, and they went straight on without speaking until suddenly Jill heard Scrub say, Look out! and felt herself jerked back. They were at the very edge of a cliff. 
Jill was one of those lucky people who have a good head for heights, and she didn't mind in the least standing at the edge of a precipice. She was rather annoyed with Scrub for pulling her back. Just as if I was a kid, she said. She wrenched her hand out of his, and when she saw how very white he had turned, she despised him. What's the matter, she said, and to show that she was not afraid, she stood very near the edge indeed, and in fact a good deal nearer than even she liked. And then she looked down. She now realized that Scrub had some excuse for looking white, for no cliff in our world is to be compared with this. Imagine yourself at the top of the very highest cliff you know, and imagine yourself looking down to the very bottom, and then imagine that the precipice goes on below that as far again, ten times as far, twenty times as far, and when you've looked down at all that distance, imagine little white things that at first glance might be mistaken for sheep, but presently you realize they are clouds. Not little wreaths of mist, but the enormous white puffy clouds, which are themselves as big as most mountains. And at glance, at last, in between those clouds, you get your first glimpse of the real bottom, so far away that you can't make out whether it's field or wood or land or water, farther below those clouds than you are above them. Jill stared at it, and then she thought that perhaps, after all, she would take a step back a foot or so from the edge, but she didn't like to fear of what Scrub would think, and then she suddenly decided that she didn't care what he thought at all, and that she would jolly well get away from that horrible edge and never laugh at anyone for not liking heights again. But when she tried to move, she found that she couldn't. Her legs seemed to have turned into putty. Everything was swimming before her eyes. What are you doing, Pole? C come back, blithering little idiot, shouted Scrub, but his voice seemed to be coming from a very long way off. She felt him grabbing at her. But by now, she had no control over her own arms and legs. There was a moment struggling at the cliff's edge. Jill was too frightened and dizzy to know quite what she was doing. But two things she remembered as long as she lived. They often came back to her in her dreams. One was that she had wrenched herself free of Scrub's clutches. The other was that at the same moment, Scrub himself, with a terrified scream, had lost his balance and gone hurtling to the depths. Oh, sorry. Fortunately, she was given no time to think over what she had done. Some huge, brightly colored animal had rushed to the edge of the cliff, and it was lying down, leaning over, and this was the odd thing, blowing. Not roaring or snorting, but just blowing from its wide open mouth, blowing out as steadily as a vacuum cleaner, sucks in. Jill was lying so close to the creature that she could feel the breath vibrating steadily through its body. She was lying still because she couldn't get up. She was nearly fainting indeed. She wished she could really faint, but faints don't come for the asking. And at last she saw, far away below, a tiny black speck floating away from the cliff and slightly upward. As it rose, it got farther away, and by the time it was nearly on a level with the cliff top, it was so far off that she lost sight of it. It was obviously moving away from them at great speed. Jill couldn't help but thinking that the creature at her side was blowing it away. So she turned and looked at the creature. It was a lion. Dun, dun, dun! Should we go on to the next chapter? What time is it? Okay. We've got a little more time. We'll start the next chapter. Chapter 2. Jill is given a task. Without a glance at, the, at Jill, the lion rose to its feet and gave one last blow. Then, as if satisfied with its work, it turned and stalked slowly back into the forest. It must be a dream. It must. It must, said Jill to herself. I'll wake up in a moment. But it wasn't, and she didn't. Oh, I do wish we'd never come to this dreadful place, said Jill. I don't believe Scrub knew any more about it than I did. Or if he did, he had no business to bring me here without warning me what it was like. It's not my fault he fell over the cliff. If he'd left me alone, we should both be all right. And then she remembered again the scream that Scrub had given when he fell and burst into tears. Crying is all right in its way, while it lasts. But you have to stop sooner or later, and, when you and you still have to decide what to do next. And when Jill stopped, she found that she was dreadfully thirsty. She had been lying face downward, and now she sat up. 
The birds had ceased singing, and there was a perfect silence, except for one small, persistent sound, which seemed to come from a good distance away. She listened carefully and felt almost sure it was the sound of running water. Jill got up and looked around her very carefully. There was no sign of the lion, but there were so many trees about that it might easily be very close without her seeing it. For all she knew, there might be several lions, but her thirst was very bad now, and she plucked up the courage to go looking for that running water. She went on tiptoes, stealing cautiously from tree to tree, and stopping to peer round her at every step. The wood was so still that it was not difficult to decide where the sun was. It grew clearer every moment, and sooner than she expected, she came into an open glade and saw the stream, bright as glass, running across the turf a stone's throw away from her. But although the sight of water made her feel ten times thirstier than before, she didn't rush forward and drink. She stood as still as if she had been turned to stone with her mouth wide open, and she had a very good reason. Just on the side of the stream lay the lion. It lay with its head raised and its two forepaws out in front of it. She had knew at once that it had seen her, for its eyes looked straight into hers for a moment and then turned away, as if it knew her quite well and didn't think much of her. If I run away, it, it'll be after me in a minute thought uh, Jill, and if I go on, I, I shall run straight into its mouth. Anyway, she couldn't have moved if she had tried, and she couldn't take her eyes off of it. How long this lasted, she couldn't be sure. It seemed almost like hours, and the thirst became so bad that she almost felt as if she would not mind being eaten by a lion if only she could get a drink of a mouthful of water first. If you're thirsty, you may drink. They were the first words she had heard since Scrub had spoken to her on the edge of the cliff. And for a second she stared here and there, wondering who had spoken. And then came the voice again. If you are thirsty, come and drink. And of course she remembered what Scrub had said about animals. Sorry, give me a sec. Talking in that other world, and she realized that it was the lion speaking. Anyway, she had seen its lips move this time, and the voice was not like a man's. It was deeper, wilder, and stronger. A sort of heavy, golden voice. It did not make her any less frightened than she had been before, but it made her frightened in a rather different way. Are you not thirsty? said the lion. I'm dying of thirst, said Jill. Then drink, said the lion. May I? Could I? Would you mind... Going away while I do it, said Jill. The lion answered this only by a look and a very low growl. And as Jill gazed into its motionless bulk, she realized that she might as well have asked the whole mountain to move aside for her convenience. The delicious rippling noise of the stream was driving her nearly frantic. Will you promise not to do anything to me if I do come, said Jill. I make no promise, said the lion. Jill was so thirsty now that without noticing it, she had come a step nearer. Do you eat girls? She said. I have swallowed up girls and boys, women and men, kings and emperors, cities and realms, said the lion. It didn't say this as if it was boasting or if it was as if it was sorry or angry. It just said it. I daren't come and drink. Said Jill. Then you will die of thirst, said the lion. Oh dear, said Jill, coming another step nearer. I suppose, suppose I must go and look for another stream then. There is no other stream, said the lion. It never occurred to Jill to disbelieve the lion. No one who had seen his stern face could do that, and her mind was suddenly made up. It was the worst thing she had ever had to do, but she went forward to the stream, knelt down, and began scooping up water in her hand. It was the coldest, most refreshing water she had ever tasted. You don't need to drink much of it, for it quenched your thirst at once. And before she tasted it, she had been intending to make a dash away from the lion the moment she finished. But now she realized that this would be, on the whole, the most dangerous thing of all. She got up and stood there with her lips still wet from drinking. Come here, said the lion. I'm going to pause there for today. Have a great day. Don't drive your parents crazy.